Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Waka. Waka. Um, for those of... <laughs> my name is Padusha Mrakaholic. <laughs> for those of you that uh, don't speak Eskimo yet, uh, Waka means hello or welcome in the Yupik Eskimo language. So Waka, everybody. Waka. Uh, waka, especially to the newcomers, and uh, happy birthday to the um, birthday people. So amazing stories. Um, <clears throat> and I just want to say, Eric, you did a really good job, didn't he? Yeah. Oh, my God, he has some huevos, you know. <laughs> uh, seriously, you know, I remember re- obviously very nervous, and he said, hey, I'm the 10-minute, and I'm like, wow, that's so cool. You want to trade? I'm, I'm the 40-minute. He said, <laughs> and he said, Sure. You know, I'm like, whoa, he's got some balls. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've, speak, I, I've main speak at a lot of conventions as the main speaker, and uh, I speak a lot. Um, it never gets easy. It, ne- it really it never does. I mean, I think I cursed myself when I was a newcomer, and I had such a big ego, I... You know, I was sitting there as as a newcomer, and I listened to um, speakers, and I'm like, I can speak better than that, <laughs> you know. And then I think God said, Oh yeah, we're gonna make you a speaker. And it, it's never, never easy. So I'm 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 really kind of freaking out. I was in the bathroom trying to get in the zone, you know, and just just tell my story. I I, I uh, you know, I am sober 20 years, um, but my my sobriety, even though I have continuously stayed sober for 20 years every day, every night, you know, my story is not pretty, even even sobriety. And, and I, I wrestle with myself, how uh, should I disclose that? How, you know, should I tell, you know, how unpretty my, my sobriety is, you know? And... Um, <sighs> But I don't see any saints here. <laughs> I'm with my people. Yeah, as um, who introduced me as the Eskimo? Yeah, I am an Eskimo, full-blooded Yupik Eskimo. That's why I look like this. <laughs> And back in the day, uh, I moved to Hawaii so I won't freeze to death when I pass out. (laughs) You get it, right? You get it. (laughs) Um, I, uh, I gotta go back to where I was born in uh, in Alaska, and I grew up in a little log cabin, and it was smaller than the, from here to the wall, and a little bit wide, but there was 11 of us. There was nine kids and, and two adults, and there was no running water. Um, there, was, there was no electricity. There was no stores. There was no cars. There was no roads. There was no... I mean, we were rich Eskimos because we had a pump in the one corner. We had an actual pump. And uh, if it didn't freeze, people would come and get water from us. You know, we'd just give out water. And uh, and um, looking back, you know, I could remember how happy we were, you know. All the girls would sleep on one row, and all the boys would sleep on one row. And my mom and my dad would sleep on the bed. And uh, there was a cupboard, 
And uh, there was an outhouse in the back, and there was like 14 dogs dog for the dog sled outside. And that was usual. That was normal, you know, for the whole village. <clears throat> and um, but I got to go further back than that. My mom, um, my biological father, he he would be drunk and beat up my mom, you know, and uh, severely. And she used to run away from him. This is the stories because my biological dad died when I was one, but. I heard the stories of it. She went from village to village uh, with all her kids. She'd grab all her her nine kids and uh, tie up my biological father and uh, <laughs> when because he was violent and uh, she'd put us all in the dog sled and go to the next village and and beg people, let's stay there. I need to live. I need to live here. And uh, they'd give her abandoned, really old um, log cabins. And then he'd find her and beg to stay, be sober for a while, and then got drunk and beat her up again. Then we'd have to do it again. And um, one time she she moved to Kalskag, Lord Kalskag, and he, he came and he begged and he, she let him in. And uh, my... Um, he got drunk. He beat her up. My tw- my oldest brother, he was 12. He took a hammer to his, to my father's head and hit him on the head, and it took him two days to die. And so he, my, my biological father died of alcoholic death at the hands of my, my oldest brother, 12 years old. And, uh, and for years after that, my, my mom had a hard time keeping us fed because all these kids, no store, and uh, dogs that need to be fed. And, you know, when you need to go you go out, when we go out and get food, we just go out and we just get food, you know. When they go out and get food, they have to go down and hunt the food, you know, and kill it and drag its carcass, you know, moose and bring it back. It's not, it's not an easy task, you know. So... Um, <coughs> So a lot of times we didn't have food, and then she she met this um, this really young guy. He was fifteen years her junior, and he wanted to marry her. And she was like, "And here is this hunter that's going to save our family." So she married him, and uh, so he saved the family. He brought he was a good hunter. He brought in food, and. Uh, Oh, uh, then he introduced alcohol to her in mass quantities. She's full blood Eskimo, and of course, when you give a full blood uh, native in my, in my, uh, from what I see, a lot of uh, natives drink in excess. They become an alcoholic, and she became a blackout alcoholic. And uh, she thought she met somebody that was going to save her family, and. Uh, what she didn't know it was he he was he had an appetite for little girls in a bad way and uh and see that's not the bad story about you know my bad story that's just what happened to me you know, I'm not an alcoholic. There's, there's newcomers here, and I used to have all kinds of excuses why I drink. I didn't. I, I, I'm not an alcoholic because I was hurt as a young girl by a man. I, I'm not an alcoholic because my mother allowed it. I'm not an alcoholic because I had a horrible, violent childhood. You know, I, I'm not an alcoholic because I lived on the streets as a bum and I had uh, people hurt, the other bums hurt me. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic because I put the alcohol in my system. I put the drugs in my system and that's why I'm an alcoholic. So, but anyway. Um, just want to clear that for you newcomers. What's so cool is I used to, in the rooms, I went to AA meetings for four years using that excuse, if you had my life, you would drink too, you know. And uh, this woman came up to me, she had nine years, which was like a god status. And then, <laughs> and she said, you know what, she said, Badusha, yes, you did have a bad childhood, and uh, you could use that as an excuse, just like breaking your shoelace 
is an excuse. It's, it's just as good as excuse as breaking your shoelace. So if you were looking for, uh, a, um, excuse, any excuse will do, but you had a bad childhood and now you have a chance to make an, an awesome adulthood. And that's what broke it. You know, that's what it hit me, you know, that I could have an awesome adulthood. And, uh, so that, that changed, that changed a lot of things that I was in power. Now, see now, okay, now we're going to get into why my sobriety is so not stellar. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, came into the rooms and I, uh, took me four years to get one year. <clears throat> And I, I had, uh, I came in with Daisy Dukes on and five inch heels and sores all over my body, uh, all over my legs and missing teeth. And uh, yeah. <laughs> and I thought it was hot. You know, it's like. <laughs> and I. I, I could never keep a purse because I'd black out and I'd lose my purse, you know. And I also bang my head or get in the fights and I didn't have glasses so I couldn't see, you know. And, um, I, uh, oh, in my first almost three years, I, uh, I, uh, didn't have any boundaries and, uh, I, I had sex with a lot of people in the rooms and, um, guys. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but in therapy, it told the, he, my therapist, she told me that it was just reenactments and I didn't understand. But what's bad about it? What is the miracle was I, th that's not the miracle, but what was, was, because I was, I didn't have any boundaries, and because to me, sex equal love, and girls would get pissed off at me for looking at their guys or you know flirting with their guys, and guys uh, would not, they would take me to lunch and dinner after the meeting or coffee, and uh, but they treat me like shit the next time they saw me. No, no woman would talk to me. They all hated me, and no men would talk to me. And when you come off the streets and nobody's talking to you, you know, it's a very, very lonely. You don't have alcohol, and you don't have drugs to to satisfy you, and I was really alone. And it's a freaking miracle that I stayed sober and being alone, you know. And plus I was... I was a, a fighter. I, I mean, I come from the streets. I come from my Jerry Springer family, you know. <laughs> and, and I, I would my. I had three. This is how crazy I was. All right, I had three years sober at a meeting. It was in Kahala, in Hawaii, and Kahala is like La Jolla, you know, and it's like really. Very nice, and it, and I was sitting in the back, and, and this guy was talking to me. He said something about my woman parts, so I got offended. And I, how what do you call it when you hit somebody so hard without them knowing it? Sucker punch. I planted it good. I was gonna make. I want to make sure that this one planted good, and he was gonna have a black eye. So I just. Bam! My whole body, my whole <laughs> in it, you know, and and he, he fell, and then I jumped on him. Everybody jumped on us. We start rolling around in this La Jolla type meeting during the meeting, you know, and uh, that's okay. That's a three years sober, so. <laughs> I'm so much. I'm so much better than I was since last since last Tuesday. No, just kidding. No, I haven't had a fight since then. Fish. I had to go make amends to him. Anyway, 
jeez. So, um, uh, so my my road was really, really rough, extremely rough. And uh, I got to tell you, when I was uh, backtracking a little again, when I was a street person, um, when I did have um, custody of my daughter. Uh, when I started to become, uh, I didn't start drinking till I was almost 27 because I was irritating born again Christian. And, um, <laughs> I was, I really was. So I didn't start drinking till I was almost 27. And, uh, but when I did take the drink and I really believe that, um, we're genetically dispositioned to obtain alcoholism. When I did take a drink, I, I did went gusto. And I, I was, didn't have money because I kept getting fired. And I had an apartment and I would lock my little girl and she remembered this. I would lock her in the apartment and I would lock her and she would be crying on the other side of the locked apartment because, and I'd have to leave to go be a bar fly. And, uh, and I was thinking if the, if the building in the apartment, um, burns down, she's gonna die, you know, but I, I could not, not do it. I, I had to go, you know, and she remembers this and it gets even worse than that. When we, we became homeless, we would, uh, couch surf. Her and I would go couch surfing and whoever, whatever men will take us in. And, um, and then we were living in, sometimes in abandoned cars. And she would take care of me because I'm a twice a day drunk. And, uh, CPS finally got a hold of us and, uh, and took her away from me. And that's when I started using other, other forms of alcohol. And when I was three years sober, I got her back. And I didn't know how to be a parent because she's used to being the parent. So we had to, we had to struggle for the power. You know, who, who's in charge? Cause I didn't know how to be a parent. I mean, I had my parents for role models, you know, uh, it's so crazy. And, um, when she was, um, 11, she was smoking pot. By the time she was 13, she was doing heroin and cocaine. And she got sober when she was 17. And she's now 30 with 12 years sober. All of you moms and dads that have kids that are struggling and out there and dying and, and now sober, um, I feel you. You know, my heart goes out to you. All the the big fights, you know, big fights. So, um, I, uh, I and I have a grandson, and he's two years old, and he looks like an Eskimo, but he. <laughs> He's, but he's blonde hair and blue eyed, you know? He's so, and he calls me Anna. Anna means grandma in Yupik. And so he calls me Anna. And we have so much fun. We have so much fun. Grandmahood is the best. I hope you live long enough to be a grandma. And, uh, I hope your, your, uh, children become, uh, if they're alcoholics to become sober. Sober alcoholics with long term sobriety. You know, fight, you know, fighting with her when she was drinking. Now, when we fight, it's, we do AA zingers at each other <laughs> in our, like, we, we say acceptance, stuff like that. So it's a way different, it's a way different way to fight. So I, I prefer it. It's, it's, it's kind of funny, even though I really mad at her sometimes. Quietly, I laugh because we fight different ways. So most time, um, yeah, she's she's my pride and joy. She's got my heart. You know, she's got my soul. Um, I want to talk about um, I uh, I at eight years sober, I was asked to do a first convention speaker, the Saturday night speaker, and I was. Very nervous, very excited. Was this in Walla Walla, Washington? And so I had, I was married at the time, uh, with somebody with five more years than I was. I, um, and I, I had eight years and, uh, he had 13 years. 
and we went up to Wallen Wall in Washington. We went there uh, a week early so we could help them because there's a lot of fires to put out right right at convention time, right before the convention goes up. So we went there a week early so we could help them and be of service. And and I, I told my ex, I told my, he's not my ex-husband. I told, by the way, he's my favorite ex-husband. <laughs> when you're so, when you are divorced from a, a sober alcoholic, it's, is I had a, uh, a, a husband before him, but that was my trial husband. <laughs> but this, this one, he's my favorite ex-husband. I love him. He still send me texts. I love him. But anyway, um, I told him, would you please go get the the flyer because I want to, you know, I want to see the I want to see the uh, list of events at this convention. What I really wanted to see is my name on the on the flyer. <laughs> and so he went and got the flyer. He came back and he showed me there's list of events and and uh, and then I look at and I saw church service written down. I'm like, what the hell is this? We're having a church service and a convention. And he, and then I look at the top, it said AA slash CMA. I said, what's CMA? And he, and we investigated, it was uh, Christian Motorcycle Association. <laughs> So it was AA slash CMA. And I'm like, that's not going with traditions. We're separate from everything. We can't, we can't be with the Christian Motorcycle Association. <laughs> and so I went to the, the committee and I said, what, what is this? You know, and, and we said, this is not, this is not cool. And, and the guy that ran it, he, he, uh, he said, how much time do you have? And I went, eight and a half years, like, a, like I'm a big girl now, right? And he said, I have 20 years, so shut up. Oh. I almost harpooned his ass right there. You know? <laughs> We had we I we didn't have no fist flying, but we were close nose to nose. <laughs> and uh, my my ex husband was all Al Anon, you know. <laughs> and so we got broken up. And so I called my sponsor, and she said, "Did you yell?" And I said, "Yes." She said, "We well, got to go make amends." And I'm like, oh, wow. What? Blah, 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 blah. She said, go make amends. So I'm like, so I went to go make amends. We got into another again. <laughs> like really big, like chairs flying. It's just like, it was crazy. And then I called, every, and those motorcycle people were getting involved. They like to fight, right? <laughs> so I, I, um, went to call my sponsor and she said, she said, did you yell? I'm like, yes. And she said, you gotta, you gotta mend, you gotta make amends for the amends that you made. Uh, <laughs> what, like you never did that. But anyway, so, <laughs> so I, um, she said, but this time you'll read the 10th tradition. Uh, if I had the big book, uh, the big book. Um, if I had the big book about the long form of the tent tradition, really look at it where it says you can't even hint about your uh, affiliation with any of your, the definition of your God or something to that matter. So we can't, the people that preach, get up and preach and turn meetings into churches, uh, that's breaking tradition. We can say God of our own understanding. That's why it's in italics. <clears throat> so uh, she said, just read the tent tradition. If he, if he comes at you, people were coming at, because we had an RV, people were coming to the RV, they were trying to call me out, these bikers, and fight me, and for a whole week, all right, I'm trying to help them to put up this, and they want to fight me, so I didn't sleep for a whole, almost a whole week, I didn't eat, I was so stressed out, and, and, uh, 
And he said, we're going to take you off this. He said, I, I told him, you, I don't have to speak for you guys. I only, I can't speak for CM, uh, Christian Motorcycle Association. I can only speak as an alcoholic. And, uh, he, and he said, well, we can't, we can't take you off because your name is already on there. We, you have to speak. And so, okay. So I didn't fight with anybody. And, uh, I got up and, it was like 800 to 1,000 bikers, and they were leathered up, and they had tattoos, and they were stinky and hairy. And, <laughs> and that was just the women. And I, <laughs> so I, I thought I was going to get burned at the stake. You know, I was like... So I told him my story, and then I told of the tent tradition and what was happening to me the whole week, you know, that I've been, no, no punches were land, but a lot of people were spitting in my face, and, uh, and really, really, you know, a lot of people. And that, and but I have to stand up for the tent tradition, because I want, if my grandson ever needs this, I want this place, AA, to always be there, and the traditions will hold us together. I don't know if you're not going to clap for that. What the hell? <laughs> and uh, when I, I did, I, I said my piece about the tent tradition, and one old-timer got up, and he, sh he started clapping. Everybody started clapping. And they clap, 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 because I was crying and I was scared. And um, so that 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 was one of the things that happened. The w another thing that happened was um, I went to Burning Man. <laughs> <laughs> what? No, no. You know what? I got my way paid for. T to Burning Man for 10 years, and I would not go because I'm too sober for that. You know, all this people drinking and drugging and throwing off their clothes and stuff like that. I had enough problem with that. You know, I didn't need more of that, right? So I went to Burning Man. I mean, my daughter, for my 50th birthday, she, she for a whole year, she wanted me to go to Burning Man. I, I told her, no, no, I'm not going to go to Burning Man. And, and about three days before we were going to go, she said, you're going to Burning Man. I'm like, oh, my God. All right, let's go to Burning Man. So we went to Burning Man. I got there on a Sunday night. I didn't sleep. T I, I had 16 years sober. I didn't sleep uh, till Thursday. That's how much fun it was. <laughs> and you know what? The naked people, just like... <laughs> There's like 5,000 naked people there like t to like 60,000 people. So it's not all crazy. And <laughs> yeah. And um, no, I didn't go naked. So don't worry about that. But anyway, I had, and, um, but there's what's so cool about it. They have a, a place called Anonymous Village. They have Stella, the Stella camp. And they have, the, they're all a, a hokey pokey camp where you turn yourself around. <laughs> You know, and there's about a thousand AA members that go there, like with ten years, twenty years, thirty years, forty years, go there, and they're the funnest people you've ever met. They don't have like, like you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this. They don't have that. They're like live and let live. You know, it's so freaking awesome. The most open-minded alcoholics you ever did want to live. So, I had so much fun, and I I got there on a Sunday night. I didn't sleep till Thursday, and people were like, "You have to sleep." I'm like, "No, there's this happening and this happening." Oh, run, run, run! They're like, "No, you have to sleep. You have to sleep." So they forced me into this tent and let me stay there until I calmed down. Until I actually fell asleep. That's how much fun I had. Because I'm addicted to fun. I don't know about you, but I'm addicted to fun. So, and so I, um, I, what was the crowning point was they went, I would, they, they told me that I have to go check out the temple. So I went to the temple 
and because I'm open minded spiritually, and I, I went to the temple and they were writing really hard stuff. Like I, somebody wrote, I killed somebody by accident, and I'm sorry, and I and I love you, and and you know people were talking about being raped. Uh, uh, and really hard stuff on the temple, like these hard things people are crying and were releasing all this pain. And I felt so moved that I wrote to my mom. I mean, she was still alive. My mom, I, growing up with her, I never spoke to her ever. <laughs> Imagine you not ever speaking to your mother. Imagine not speaking to your father ever, and you live in a small place. You don't speak to them. I just... You know, I'm a dutiful, I'm a native woman, native little girl. You respect your, I don't know what it, in other cultures, but in native village, you respect the elders. You don't talk back. And that's what I did. I never talked back. I never disrespected my mom. I just did what she said. I never talked to her. You know, other people talk to their moms, but I never did. I hated her. So I wrote all this, and I said, you know what? I wrote to my mom, I said, you let our dad, I use really bad words, but I said, you let him do things to us for alcohol, but I forgive you, and I forgive dad. Because there's, in AA, there's good men. It has shown me good men, you know? And, uh, and, and you're, I'm 16 years sober, and your granddaughter is sober. I forgot how much she, time she had at that time. And that one of these days we'll meet in the big meeting in the sky, and we'll be one big happy family. You know? And people were crying. They were reading my stuff and they were crying. And I shed all that hate. I shed it all. And it lifted from me. It lifted from me. Like the obsession to drink and alcohol lift from me. That was that how powerful. And was right in time too because that following October, she died. And I was never going to bury my parents. I was going to dance on her grave and defecate on my father's grave. She died, and I went to bury her and honor her because something happened to her as a child. I mean, she did all this stuff for us kids, you know. And I buried her with love. And then the following year, my stepfather called me and he said, I'm dying of cancer. Would you help me die? And I said, I gotta call my sponsor. I hung. <laughs> because he asked me you know, to bathe him and I didn't want to see him like that. You know, his body. I mean, I don't want to touch him. So I called my sponsor, and she said, is this what you want to do for you? And I said, yes. She said, go do it. So I, I called him up and said, I'm going to come help you bury you. And I put my card, and I bought a ticket. And I called my brothers and sisters. They said, how could you honor this monster? How could you do this to us? And I said, I got to release him. So I went up there. In route, he died. I never got to see him uh, alive again, but I buried him. And not all my family members came to his burial, but the ones that did, we I was holding their hands, and we were around the grave, and their tears, not of grief, but of joy of releasing him because we talked about forgiveness. It was, so this big book talks about for you and countless others, you know. 
and I, they felt the release too, you know. And it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful, beautiful releasing. The, um, <clears throat> all this, I got to tell you, that that's one of the most beautiful things to forgive. And and I if if you and for sixteen years when I had sixteen years, if you're not feeling forgiveness, is there somebody that you can't forgive, even if you have long term sobriety, just be open to it. Just be open. If you could do this exercise with me, like close your eyes and think of the person that hurt you and say, I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. You could feel your heart opening, but and you open your eyes and all that hate comes back. It does. I know that feeling that hate come back. But if you keep practicing, your heart will get softer, you know, and it'll lift from it. That hate will lift from you, and uh, the causes and conditions. It's it's an amazing process. Uh, so I feel. I, you know, I feel there was a lot of story in private that people that I I tell more detail about this, but um, there was something else I was supposed to. Oh, service! <laughs> I fucking hate service. <laughs> right, right, right. Be honest. Let's be honest. <laughs> but every time I do my service, I feel awesome afterwards. For ten and a half years, uh, every Wednesday night at the PB Alana Club, we call my village up in Alaska, and the Eskimos sit around a speakerphone. And in San Diego, uh, the Eskimos in my village sit around a speakerphone. In, in PB Alana Club. We sit on a speakerphone, and we've been carrying the message to my village for over ten and a half years. Wow. So, if any sponsees don't want to do a six months commitment, whatever, I got ten and a half years of the same commitment. <laughs> um, yeah, and my family don't come to this to the meeting because family will not listen to family, as you know. But there are sober alcoholics in that village now, you know. And because uh, I've, I've always wanted to help in some way, but my family so Jerry Springer, I have to stay. I have to stay out of harpoon range, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I can't tell you enough how much I love this program. You know, I can't tell you. I'm, um, I can't tell you. And and my sponsees, I love them so much. And my daughter and all my friends and my home group and the Eskimos. If I die today, you know, most of my battles are, are done, you know, and, uh, I, I hope you get this thing. I hope you get this thing. You know, I hope you have the transformations that are inside of you wanting to come out and you could feel it coming out. You know, life is good. Life is good. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.